The story of the prodigal son, or as it is sometimes called, the story of the father who had two sons. It's one of the best known and most beloved stories in all of Scripture. We know it by heart. A father has two sons. The younger one is feeling his oats and wants to go sow some wild ones. He comes to his father and asks for an advance on what will one day be his share of the estate. The father obliges, divides his property between his two sons, and gives the younger son his share. In no time at all, the younger son takes off for a far and distant country. He takes off for a land literally between the limits somewhere between the boundaries and constraints of his father's home and the land of unlimited freedom. Somewhere in that country is where the younger son heads. He squanders his property in dissolute living, such a grand and formal phrase, for he cast everything to the winds, not caring a bit about how much he was spending or where not caring about saving for rent, or car insurance, or health insurance, or taxes, or utilities, or even food. All that son cared about was living big, feeling good, and having the craziest, wild, carefree time of his life. But money is one of those finite resources, and it does run out. And it did for that son. And the depletion of his resources lined up just about exactly with the timing of a severe famine in that land. And he began to be in need, like he didn't have anything. But this younger son was resourceful. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and that citizen sent that boy out to his fields to feed the pigs. That's a pretty low, low. Remember, for an Israelite, pigs were by definition unclean animals. But it gets lower. This younger son said he would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. When you're longing for the pig pods to fill your belly, and you can't even get those, you've hit bottom. But when you hit bottom, when everything else has stopped working, when everything else falls away, when all of our strategies and plans are lying to the side in a dust heap, well, that's when we have the absolute best shot of finding our way home. And so the journey began for the younger son. The story continues. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. Days and days the younger son walks. Maybe he's thinking back over his choices. Maybe he's feeling regret. Maybe he's thinking about really turning his life around. Or maybe he's not. Maybe this is all just one more play to get some food in his belly. But it doesn't really matter how pure his intentions are, or whether or not he's properly contrite, or whether he has learned from his mistakes. All that matters is that he was headed toward home. What happens next is just beautiful. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Like the father was moved in his bowels 
Yes, that's really what the Greek says. In his guts. And he ran and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. Not like just once, but over and over and over he kissed him. Like sloppy, snotty, heaving, crying, wet kisses. The kind that totally embarrass your children. Especially grown-up ones. And all this happens before the son has said a word of his prepared speech where he proclaims how badly he's missed the mark and how he sinned against heaven and before his father and how he's no longer worthy to be called a son. And he can't get out the rest of his speech. The boy never even gets to say, so treat me like one of your hired hands. The father cuts him off. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. All that matters to the father is that his son is home. His son is alive. His son who was lost is found. The only response is to rejoice and celebrate. Great ending to the hero's journey. But the story has two sons. Ah, the elder son. He's working out in the field when all this transpires. They didn't even go out and get him. It's not until he comes in and approaches the house that he hears the music and dancing. For real? They could have at least called him in, don't you think? He has to ask a slave what's going on. And the slave explains that his brothers come home and his father has killed the fatted calf. Oh, that elder son began to feel something stirring in his bowels. He could feel heat rising up through his heart. He could feel his throat tighten and his face go red and his fist clench. He's really angry and refused to go in to the welcome home party. His father got wind that the elder son was steaming and he went out to the boy and began to plead with him. But the elder son was having none of it. Listen, for all of these years, I've been working like a slave for you. And I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Father was filled with compassion for this son too. And he simply said, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. And like any good storyteller, Jesus leaves us hanging. We never know if the elder son chooses to join the party or not. Okay, we've got to pause here and do a little survey. How many of you have done the younger son thing? Had to take off for the distant country somewhere between the limits you grew up with and total freedom? How many of you just had to strike out on your own path just to see what it looked like out there? Show of hands. And how many of you have done the elder son thing? Remember, Jesus is telling the story to the scribes and the Pharisees who were complaining incessantly about Jesus hanging out with the tax collectors and sinners and enjoying it, no less. How many of you have gone the way of duty and obligation 
and doing the right thing and taking care of your responsibilities and all the while nursed a good bit of resentment about being so good, especially as you noticed all those slackers having fun while you were taking care of business, elder sons? And how many of you, of you have been that father worrying about your children, trying to understand each one in their own right, worrying about the relationship between them? How many of you have stood on that front porch for years wondering if your child was okay, looking toward the horizon, wondering if they'd ever make their way home? Father's on the front porch. And how many of you have been all three? <laughs> we love this story because we live this story over and over and over again. It is the story of our most intimate relationships, our dreams, our fears, our longings, our sense of worthiness, our deepest resentments, our deepest joys. And to get to the relationship, to get to communion, to get to reconciliation, every single person in this story has to release something, has to let go of something, has to surrender something. To let the younger son go off to begin with, the father had to let go of his dreams for his son. His dreams of how his two boys might have worked together. The dreams and expectations that he'd been spinning out in his own head for years. The father had to let all of these go and trust that this was a journey that his son had to make. And then to receive the younger son back as a son, the father had to let go of his hurt, let go of his own anger about the sleepless nights and the heartache that comes when you don't know if your child is okay out in the world. The father had to let go of his desire to punish, to ensure that the boy had properly learned his lesson and had to let go of all his I told you so's that he so wanted to say. The father had to let go of any notion of love with fine print disclaimers. The younger son had to let go of his pride. It's humbling to go home admitting that the path didn't quite work out like you thought it would. And to be received back as a son, that boy had to let go of his shame and his sense that he wasn't worthy to be called a son, but that he was only worthy to be a hired hand. The younger son had to surrender the notion that our sonship, our daughtership, our status as a child of God is contingent upon our behavior. It's not. It's a given. The bond established in baptism is indissoluble. You are a beloved son, a beloved daughter. You are a beloved child of God. You can't undo it, ever. What we can squander is our own sense of, the, of that inalienable worth, but never the worth itself. You are worthy of the robe and the ring and the fatted calf, always. But you do have to surrender the belief that you aren't worthy of these things in order to receive them. And the elder son has to let go of his carefully constructed system of justice, of what's fair and what's not, of who's deserving and who is not. The elder son has to let go of living out of duty and obligation instead of joy. Was it the father's reluctance to give him a goat 
or even a fatted calf for him and his friends to celebrate? Or was it the elder son's reluctance to make known his desire and ask for such an extravagance? Does the elder son also struggle with his worthiness? No less than the younger son. The younger son believes he is no longer worthy to be called a son, but should now be treated as a hired hand. The elder son has lived as a slave, never believing himself a son to begin with. And the elder son has to let go of resentment if he is ever to make his way through the door into the distant country of celebration and joy. Through this parable, Jesus gives hope to the tax collectors and the sinners who've been told they aren't worthy to be at the table. But this parable also gives hope to the Pharisees and the scribes who are standing outside this big, raucous, fatted calf, full-on joy celebration. Resentment is a cruel bouncer barring entrance to the party. But Jesus does not force us to receive love and grace. Anything that forces is coercive and doesn't respect our freedom to choose. Jesus never coerces, but always woos. The decision to let go and come on in rest in the Pharisees and the scribes and the elder son's hands and in ours. Truth be told, we've all got to let go of something to get to that communion with God and with one another that our hearts so deeply long for. On this particular day, who are you? The younger son? The elder son? The father? The tax collectors and scribes? The Pharisees? The sinners? Who are you? And what do you need to surrender to get on with enjoying your brother or your sister, your son or your daughter, your father or your mother? What do you need to surrender to get on with enjoying the fatted calf? We're all lost, yearning to be found. And God is always running toward us while we are still a long ways off. You never were a hired hand, but always God's beloved. That's the journey home that we all have to make. <laughs>